So uh, because the camera's at this angle, it's best to have it going up at you so it doesn't block your face. He should be a porn director. Scoot doo. Blabbity blue. Scoot dee. Oh yeah. Cool. Writers Guild members just got a message from JJ Abrams, so I'll read that later. Yeah. I wonder what wonder what JJ's up to. I already read it. You did? Yeah. What did he say? He's like, dude, this is not acceptable. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's good. So we went to uh, the Lakers game, the Lake Show yesterday. Uh, yeah. More like the LeBron show. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, right when he picked me up, something in the car came on that got me thinking. And I, uh, and we talked about this yesterday. Uh-huh. We said we should... Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Dude. And what I wanted to talk to you about, he, I, and I was saving it because I remember I wanted to talk to you about this yesterday. This song okay. makes me makes me shoot, dude. From the hip. Dude, <sighs> I once had this girl over. You know the one I'm talking about, the one with the double Ds. Okay. Okay. Right. Not right. the C cup girl, the double Ds. No, no, no. Right, right. Right. And I put this song on, right? You put the song on or you put an episode on? I put the song on. I play uh-huh. it on my Alexa. I said, Alexa, play that play the Game of Thrones theme song. Uh-huh. And then, the, so basically, what happens is, I, it's like, so, all right, so the girl comes over, and you know me, right? Mm-hmm. She's fucking, you know me. How would you describe s- these girls, dude? They're, they're, uh, they're wildly out of your range. If this were the 90s, you wouldn't even be able to talk to them, dude. But because it's the social media age, and you do stand up <laughs> once in a while, not only can you talk to them, they'll come to your, this one bedroom apartment in the valley. <laughs> Uh, and do things and then leave. No, I no. They don't just do things and then leave. This was not an option back in the nineties for right. guys like Rick. But the truth is, you know me, right? Sure. And I, when, it, I, when when a woman comes over, mm-hmm. you know I'm nothing but class. Yeah. So you she get her can, wine, get her a glass of vino, give her a coaster, make sure she keeps it on the coaster. Yeah. Take your shoes off. Relax. You show her your uh, your Hulk. A comic book and a, a literal bulletproof glass, you know, uh, you know, thing that you bought for no reason, for, so no one could shoot it. I guess I don't want people <laughs> shooting it, dude. Whenever Game of Thrones comes on, all my friends they shoot from the hip, dude. By the way, this is Hulk 181, but more than that, it's the first full appearance of, of Wolverine. Wolverine. So sure, yeah. it's a Hulk comic, but it's I bought it for Wolf. But you you tangent it off already. Yes. Yeah, so, so so the girl I, comes over. Yeah, the girl you comes say over. Alexa, play Game of Thrones Not yet. theme. Not yet. Okay. First, I get her a glass of wine. Mm. I show her some of her old sketches. Mm-hmm. Which ones? That guy and his friend sketch. YouTube.com slash that guy and his friend. Yes. It's also that guy and his friend.com, which I've been paying $8 a year for like 10 years for. So I think 80 bucks. That's, that's nothing to you. <laughs> Come on. You just made two grand last week. So the girl <laughs> comes in. I show her some sketches. I ask if she'd like a glass of water. Sure. They usually don't, but I get it anyway, and then they drink it, which always makes me think, just say yes to the water. They might also just be drinking it because it's there. And that's good. So then, you know... We get busy. Mm -hmm. All right. And then I bring her into the bedroom. Mm -hmm. But usually I don't just say, hey, let's go in the bedroom because you can't say, let's go hook up in the bedroom. You have to be like, oh, there's something. uh, The night. Did I tell you about this? uh?" Oh, so you trick them into going into the bedroom. You don't trick. They know. It's oh, code. they know. Sometimes a girl does it. Sometimes a girl will go like, didn't you say you had some cool rugs uh, in your bedroom? And I know what she's saying. She's saying, Alexa, play Game of Thrones. Okay. So I'll walk her into the room, and usually what I do is I, uh, I, I lead so they know where they're going, and uh-huh. then right when it's to the threshold, I go, I put my arm out mm-hmm. to let them choose to enter. Okay. Okay. So that's your consent contract? Yeah, I guess. That's your nonverbal. If I, she I, chooses, I, then you do whatever? Well, it's not whatever. It's not whatever. You can expand her whatever. So this girl, right? All of these girls, dude. I lay him down on the bed mm-hmm. right and they have to they um i don't like uh people wearing street clothes in my room in my bed I prefer that they wear so uh, either they're naked uh, or i give them some uh, shorts uh, fuck you stepped on it. i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry we'll do it again so i don't like women wearing uh their street clothes in my uh-huh. bed you prefer they would wear sky clothes okay <laughs> <laughs> gotcha good yeah, well, yeah, on that one did. dude oh, I mean, that God. was legit I mean, they're coming over to your house. Of course they're wearing street clothes. Yeah, but when they get in the bed, I have them put on some shorts or just get completely naked. You have them put on your clothes. Sometimes I ask them to bring bed clothes. 
I say, if you're going to stay over, uh, don't wear like wear stuff that wasn't. That's like, what I uh, want to get in the mind of these Instagram models. 70k followers nothing to bananas but she's doing well 70k followers she has like five pictures and then every sixth picture is a lingerie shot and that's the one that everyone's there for but she posts the other five as if that's not the one that they're all there for so this girl's building a following she's beautiful you wouldn't be able to talk to her in the 90s if this was high school she would do this to you if you talked to her <laughs> okay like that she's one of those girls oh, but yeah. now you do stand up once or twice a week at the improv <laughs> These girls come over and they obey your rules. They put on, they put on, a, you make them bring a change of clothes. <laughs> you don't even take them on a date. You bring them to your one bedroom valley apartment where there's mold out in the hallway and there's leaks and shit. <laughs> you're making and then, this. You're making no, this. I just want to get into these women's <laughs> mind. If you girls could DM me and tell me what's going on because the girl, the world is their oyster. They could go to the fucking Sky Lounge, baby. They could go to the fucking whatever. What's the Sky Lounge? So, <laughs> I'm sure there's a bar called Sky Lounge. <laughs> that you can go to the. What's the one that you have to be a douchebag to go to, to be a member of? You, Soho. Yeah, you think you go to Soho? Shout out to Soho. Boy, though. Shout out. Give us the free membership. Shout out. <laughs> but like, and then and then they just obey you and they'll do whatever and then they'll just leave and you don't even have to put an effort. You don't even. You're wearing pajamas. You're not even get, getting dressed or dressing nice. You're not whining and dining. You're just like, yo, let's watch Game of Thrones and then follow my rules and obey me into the bedroom and I'll climax and then you'll leave. No, that's not. That's not <laughs> what happens. Why do these girls? But well, like, now I'm feeling no, defensive because that's but, not the but, but, reality. But, but, but for one second, take yourself out of your mind. But that's yourself, not what happens. Put yourself in their mind. Okay. Why are they doing this? If the girl was Wait, you, are you listening? That why, does, but John, but that doesn't happen. Would, but I, I don't know. To, I need I've to, never seen it happen. Would, I don't if know. A girl DM'd you. And she was wearing pajamas uh -huh. and she didn't, she looked like crap, relatively speaking. She didn't do her makeup. You're saying this is me. Yeah. Right. And you show up, you're wearing your best stuff. Right. You just worked out. You just had a photo shoot. You've got 80,000 followers mm -hmm. on Instagram. Guys are DMing you all the right. time. I'm oh, sorry. Girls are DMing you all the time. You drive over there and the girl's like, hey, <laughs> where would you want to watch like Game of Thrones? And then like, if you could change your clothes and go into my bed. Well, you wouldn't do it. Either do they. This doesn't happen. <laughs> what are you not listening to? That's not... You just... I, I you, First of all, I've never played Game of Thrones to have sex with a girl. I'm fucking you around. That. I'm joking. Oh, I believed you because you're such a good actor. Thank you. <laughs> and usually when the girls come over, I don't sleep with them. Mm. We just watch stuff and occasionally we make out. <laughs> I have sex sometimes, but I'm not a sex guy necessarily. Sure. Fuck, man! But still, I want it. I want. Also, know we don't know if there's mold I in the hallway. Know what these girls are doing. I feel like there's mold in the hallway. I used to live here before I moved recently. I may have played the Pirates of the Caribbean song <laughs> for a girl once, though. I remember she just likes pirates. Oh man! I just think it's interesting. I don't think it's bad, but it's. But I just like, want to understand the as a writer, right? Uh, as a writer, right? Like, all right. I want to know. I'll explain it to you. I want to know their world. Let me explain What's it to you. What's their point of view? Let me explain it to you. Why are they doing the things that they're doing? Let me explain it to you. <laughs> Knowing, because I ask these girls questions all the time. Why were you willing to come over? Because a lot of times I meet girls and then I don't. I, I'm like, I, and like I'll, I, like I'll talk to them, and then. Oh, see, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. You just burped. No, I, I don't, like I don't. I don't. When I meet somebody, okay, mm -hmm. and they come over, mm -hmm. here's the experience. Yeah. Okay. They're knocking at the door, right? Sure. And I say, one sec, one sec. And I go, usually nothing's happening, but I'll, I'll go like, oh, I have to hide something. You know, I have to like make a joke that she could hear through the door, uh -huh. right? You do a door joke. Yeah, I go like, oh, all right, guys, guys, hide, hide the elephants under the bed. Hide the elephants under the bed or whatever. You know, something that's obviously a joke. Yeah. That way they're laughing. And then you open the door when I open and the you door, pretend that there's hidden elephants. I pretend. What does that look like? I pretend that there's not hidden elephants. Mm -hmm. that's, that's getting in the mind of an actor. <laughs> <laughs> so she walks in and she goes, what were you... What were you? And I go, what are you? <gasps> oh, sorry. I thought I had a sneeze. But really, I was making her think that was the elephant under the bed. Wow. So Dude, this already. is digressing. I want to talk about you. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> but I do want to tell you about this. There was one time, the girl with the double Ds. Finish, this, finish the story and also finish telling me what the, this woman's point of view is coming over to the strange man's house. I'm not strange. And when girls You've been come DMing, over, big when, whoop. I'm not hooking up with girls most of the time. I'm uncomfortable with this. You know that. I need to get to know them at least a little bit. I get nervous. I literally, literally have girls over to be my friend. <laughs> and if there's a connection, do you have boys over to be your friend? Sure. Do you have hot boys? 
that yeah, you're a lot of my friends are on Instagram and DM. There and are they, guys and they drive over to hang out with yeah, you. Yeah. You know what? Actually, uh, in a couple weeks, in a couple weeks, my buddy Cyrus, who I met on Twitter because I saw him on So You Think You Could Dance, the first time we met, he came over and he taught me how to dance some. Yeah, I meet people online. Okay. Doesn't mean that it's but so this Jewish one on that line but, I meet people online. <laughs> you went so high. On I don't it. I leave the it. house that much. Where well, else am I going to meet them? That's something we got to work on. But there was this one time where I was just truly at my peak. peak. Thank you. Yeah. Girl comes in, mm-hmm. double Ds. Her waist, plat, plat, plu, dude. She's 35, 22, 25, okay? okay. I don't 30, know if that's good or 34, bad. 34, yeah. 62, dude. Okay. <laughs> that sounds oh, actually big. Dude, you know what? <laughs> 69, right? She might have a medical problem. <laughs> dude, <laughs> she must because this girl was loco. <laughs> okay? Good, so, good. so she comes over, right? Mm-hmm. And we're watching, you know, The Office, and and she's like, "Oh, I, this is so funny." Was she, she, she Asian? She's no, she's from uh, Miami. Oh, Miami. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. She's like, "Oh, yeah, right." And I'm like, "Oh, you've never seen?" Did she, she actually talk like that? Yeah, yeah. She goes, "I've only seen the one with David the Brent. I don't know how to do. <laughs> I don't know how to do Spanish. I don't know how to do a Spanish voice." Hey, God. So this girl's from Miami. Yeah. She sounds like an Asian girl, and yeah. she's only seen the British <laughs> office. She's never seen American office. I'm telling you, I find these interesting girls. <laughs> David Brent. Did I even mention the best part? She's got double. Yeah, you mentioned deep. that about okay. nine, nine or ten times. So she goes in my room, right? And she puts on. She brought over her bed lingerie instead of her. Flight. And you text her. You say, "Please bring your a change of bed clothes." She knew. Girls, it's 2019. No they girl know. knows that this they, guy you've been out of the like, dating doesn't like street clothes in the bed. No one assumes that. Nobody wants street clothes in the bed. Nobody wants street clothes in there. Why are There's we never pretending? been a movie all time where the two hot leads are making out and they go in <laughs> and they finally go to the bed and the guy Justin Timberlake's like, wait, put on put on bedroom clothes. <laughs> That's never. And then she changes. It doesn't have to be bedroom clothes. And then she comes clothes. back in and then they resume. Yeah. That's never happened in any movie ever. All right, but this is what's <laughs> happening now. You also haven't seen a movie where people are messaging each other on Instagram. And they're like, damn, dope, dope, tr- dope song you posted. You know, come over and let's watch. The American office. It's happening. <laughs> but I've only seen British. Anyway. And that's just where it begins for yeah. you guys. Well, and that's that was where it began, mm-hmm. right? Because I took her into my bedroom. And I'm talking, this girl's 35, yeah, 34, yeah, yeah. 46, yeah, you, 49, 62. You mentioned the right? dimensions already. Right. Yeah. So I lay her down on my bed, right? And then I I, I ask her, uh, do you like, uh, and she goes like this, Poppy. And she put her finger over my lips. And I, and I, went, I took the fingers off. And I said, a six simple words, Alexa, play Game of Thrones song, right? And she goes, huh? And then she goes, Miami. And I put my finger over. <laughs> she her. said Miami. Yeah, right. Which is how girls she from Miami. She her home city in that moment real quick. That's how when girls from, girls from Miami, instead of saying, huh, they go, Miami. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they go like this, right? And then, dude, and this is crazy, because you know me. I'm not like this stallion that could bone for like an no, hour. You're a neurotic, nervous, scared guy. Yeah, that, you know. But all... with like some confidence for some reason. Right. Yeah. But for whatever reason, this girl, I'm just talking plat, plat, <laughs> plat, right? Yeah. So my confidence is at an all-time high, right? right? I take off my pants to show my, reveal my Johnson. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, now, this thing, I mean, I'm normally, how, how, hard, how big would you say I am hard? Eight, eight and a half. Yeah, thank you. This time, I'm about... Eight and a half. Oh, so you're at max. I'm no- yeah, I'm at max. I'm normally... The skin's about to burst. Dude, that's not the only thing that's about to burst. These double Ds felt like they were about to burst, right? So, and then I just... And then I make love to her like this, dude. No joke. Right? And she's going like this. Mammy, 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 dude. No joke. You know when I bust, dude? At this part. I went like this. This isn't the theme song anymore. Oh, maybe it's this part. I went like this. I'm gonna come, and she goes meow me meow me, and I go oh oh, dude. Yeah, and <laughs> so the the I happen to know this because that theme song is on my iPhone. The theme song is about 70 seconds, so that's how long it lasted. <laughs> yeah. The opening titles to Game of Thrones are about a minute ten. Oh. So you about a buck ten on the Miami chick? <laughs> <laughs> I you know I didn't think of it. I, I I guess yeah. I guess the song's not that long, huh? No, it definitely only played once because I would have had to <laughs> ask her to ask Alexa to play it again. And then was she back off to Miami? Or is that the end of it? Yeah, I flew her home mm. on uh, JetBlue. Oh, shout out to JetBlue. Very nice. Yeah. No, man, that's not true, man. You know that. You guys, welcome to Take Your Shoes Off podcast. I'm Rick Glassman. Welcome. 
<laughs> it's been like 40 minutes. Welcome to the end of the podcast. <laughs> Uh, tonight, today is a special guest, one of my first guests, and potentially going to be uh, episode number one, John DeWalt. Um, everybody give John DeWalt a round of applause. Uh, Hi. I pr- probably already talked about you in the intro to this podcast, where you go, what's up, guys? First episode uh, is with John DeWalt, and, uh, you know. We should do more of those, by the way. Yeah. Oh, I meant the first episode of this, but. Um, yeah, I'll, I probably already referenced the first episode podcast in the opening, too. It's a big hit. Yeah. People love it. People do like it. So it's only natural for you to make more other ones, and we'll just keep keep popping them off, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> just keep popping off potties, dude. P.O.P.s, dude. So, John, yes. how I, the format of this, of this is pretty loosey-goosey, mm-hmm. but one thing I do like to start off with is introducing the audience, but in a lot of times with a lot of these guests, maybe even with us, introducing me to some of the things about you that I may not know, starting with, you're from Chicago. Yeah. You're an only child, yes. as if anybody couldn't tell already. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's your pretty parents, obvious. Your parents, uh, you are you are a child of divorce. Yep, COD. I'm and, a cod. Yep, straight up cod boy. What was that like? Uh, it was pretty great, you know. John, you're an, you're uh, you're a child of divorce. Yep. You're an only child who lives with his mother, whom of which can we discuss? Sure. Some of the personal details. She is so hot. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate that. And dude. your uh, your mom, your mom. Uh, uh, Ha- suffered with some alcoholism uh-huh. and it seemed the way i view you and i've told you this before is it seems that even though i know your mom is this unbelievable lovely person that laughs at everything thank god i love her <laughs> around i'm picturing you as a kid with your mom hair frizzy drinking from a bottle usually not home and you're making your own tv dinners watching frazier yeah and kind of like do you remember the movie scrooged with bill murray a little bit when his dad comes in and he gives he he wants Bill Murray's character as a kid, he wanted this toy train, uh-huh. and the dad on Christmas gave him the gift, and he opens it, and it's just a piece of meat. <laughs> and, and the kid's so upset, and he's just watching television. It's like television raised him. Uh-huh. I kind of, I just realized it's Scrooge that I was picturing, uh, yeah. but I picture you as Scrooge. Okay, well, I didn't get meat. I got, I usually got what I wanted for Christmas. Fuck yeah. But I also watch a lot of TV, <laughs> so there's truth to both. TV sitcoms in particular, yes, correct? Yeah. Uh, and Richard Simmons, which maybe we'll get into in a moment. Sure. But this, I don't think, coincidentally, drove you into a career where you're literally creating television now. Look at how that worked out, man. Isn't that nuts? Yeah, I don't know if you're being patronizing with me right now, because the way you said nuts is, but like, <laughs> this is what I want to get into, and this yeah, is super... Yeah, oh, get into it. Let's yeah. do it. I want to, like, a lot of people say <clears throat> about... I'm an open book. I'll tell you anything. Man. All right. Fine. When was the last time you masturbated? Um... Eight years ago? Nine years ago? I know for a fact that's true. <laughs> <laughs> So your can mom. I, can I do some acting for a second? This, <laughs> sure. is, this is changing the subject. So let's do that again, uh, dude. I'll, I'll I'll tell you anything. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, when was the last time you masturbated? <laughs> so yeah, about my mom's alcoholism. Uh, right? Yeah, I mean, you could have kept. I would have liked to see you. You just t- showed me a transition. You didn't yeah. show me acting. Oh, I thought. May I show you how, yeah. how to? If you you're trying to skirt around it, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me show you how to do it. We could just go back to the uh, thing you were just talking about, the um, my mom's alcohol, the TV raising me. Sure. Do you not want to talk about the masturbation? Oh, we will. We will. We will. We will. But oh, let's, all right, let's great. get right back first to the uh, yeah. Frasier of it all. So your mom's <laughs> running around, frizzy hair, drinking from a bottle in a nightgown. Okay. It's, it's, <laughs> it's snowing. She goes outside barefoot to get the newspaper <laughs> that you guys don't even have. And she goes, John, have you seen the <laughs> newspaper? Yeah. You know, I'm picturing her uh, hiccuping like... Um, barney from the simpsons yeah and you and you probably don't feel any trauma happening right right you're just this is life right my mom is outside with frizzy hair in the snow <laughs> my dad is teaching improv to kids with autism right uh yeah and I think you had started by then yeah and then you are just watching uh you know cheers cheers yeah three's company what does cheers mean to you Cheers means Sincerely. a lot to me, but first of all, I do need to correct your caricature of my mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, please, please. She was a single mother who worked full time job yes. to pr- provide the house and all that stuff, and commuted to work. She would drink after work, but she would never go out into the snow, <laughs> I know, I know. Into the snow barefoot or whatever. <laughs> uh, and she's also been, I believe, fifteen years sober. So one love, respect to that. Keep it strong or whatever it is. Might even be sixteen years. I don't remember. But yeah, I think ever your since, wedding was twelve years. Ever since it. I went to college, she's been sober. So that's great. But yeah, I would have a lot of free time as an only child. I, even if she wasn't 
drinking. She'd be at work until seven. I'd get home from school at three, and I'd just be just be there by myself. So I'd watch. Nick at night would have a lot of Cheers marathons, a lot of how old are you? How old are you at at this time? Seven, eight, and there's no babysitter. Right. Yeah. Pretty much always. Did you think that was unusual? No. That seems unusual, right? It seems like a seven year old have a babysitter. Yeah. But we lived in a, like not a small town, certainly it was a big suburb. But you know, it was like walk to school. It was you know safe. So you walked home. Yeah. You always felt safe. You were never missing anybody. Right. And you got home, and what do you do at seven, eight years old? Video games, TV, baby. Did you have friends at that age? <laughs> um, probably not as much. I had like one, I had like one or two at any given time. What? So seventh grade. That's uh, seven years old. That's first grade, right? Yeah. So first, second grade. Who are your friends in first through third? Man, first through third, that's a great question. Um, Because that's right when I switched schools was third grade. Your parents get divorced in first grade? When I was in kindergarten. Kindergarten. Yeah. Six. Five. Five or six. Okay. Five. But, um, yeah, I... I, um, And you lived with your mom. Your dad moves out. Yeah. You live with your mom. Yeah. And you're home alone all the time. Yeah. Which, by the way, you haven't seen Dear Evan Hansen yet, have you? No. I mean, I've listened to the... Soundtrack multiple There's times. the second to last song, the penultimate song. Which song? Is is called So Big, So Small. Mm. And it's the single mom yeah. talking to singing to her son about the hardships of being a single mom. And I took Allison to that show on Broadway. And it was the first time in my life that I thought about that time period from my mom's point of view because of the song. I only ever thought about what I lived through, my point of view. And so now, for the first time, I'm ima- I'm picturing all of the '90s from my mom's point of view as this Broadway show is happening, and I just start sobbing, like quaking, like shaking. And Allison's trying to support me, and like, and I'm like, like, like viscerally sobbing. And then we because lo- you're for the first time, you're you're gaining a new perspective on your yeah, mom, yeah, uh huh, and a new appreciation even. And then you look around the theater. And about 50% of the people are wailing, <laughs> and 50% of the people are fine. <laughs> and it's like, those are the divorce kids, <laughs> and those are the, the non divorce kids. And it was pretty awesome. <laughs> there we go. Are we listening to it? Well, I, I want to hear what it is that, um, that, uh, that, that you tapped into. Like, what was your perspective before, and then what was it once you heard this song? Like the sea story of the whole play. Like as the main stuff's going on, every once in a while you clock the mom struggling mm-hmm. to have a job and and struggling to also be a mother. And then a kind of the A story, which I won't spoil, reaches its ultimate low point, right? And then he his mom sings him the song and it's it's the second to last song of the show. And it's uh it's great. It's just phenomenal. I highly recommend you see it. I the very show. much want to see it. Yeah. I've been wanting to see it. Mm-hmm. Did you tell your mom that this? Yeah, I try to get her to see it, but she it's, she lives in Florida, and it's like three hours from wherever the tour is. I still really want to know the perspective that you have now. Like, oh my gosh, I never realized how, how hard this was for my mom. I never realized what? What was yeah, it? Yeah, it's just that. I mean, you only ever live things through yourself, but like mm-hmm. the song she talks about um, the day the dad moved out, and then all of a sudden she realizes she was alone. Um, and like she's now responsible for the whole everything the whole it used to be 50 50 in terms of just the day-to-day but also the bigger picture stuff like your kids emotional development your kids intellectual development it's she's in charge of everything and she knew that there would be space that she couldn't fill as one of the lyrics um and she knew that she wouldn't be enough uh many times as some of the lyrics and it was just like brutal and i was mm. just like shredded and it was the best that shows the best experience i've ever had watching any show of any kind ever how does Allison, your wife, because uh, she sees you cry all the time. Uh, yeah. You posted a video recently of you watching the finale. No, I posted about- uh, explaining the finale of Cheers. Yeah. And you couldn't, you weren't watery eyed. You you made the noises. You yeah. couldn't get through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I'd like to play it. Who, who, where yeah. did you post it? Uh, it's on Allison's Instagram. So the setup for this, uh, this uh, Allison, uh, shout out to Allison Buzma, 27. <laughs> I've been in bed for five days watching Cheers, and I asked John what his favorite Rebecca moment was. This is his answer. It's the series finale, and I recorded it because I knew he couldn't get through it without crying. <laughs> the guy loves TV. <laughs> okay, here it is. She runs out super excited, and she says, <laughs> Wow, I've spent all these years reaching for Evan Drake and Robin Colcord, and I ended up marrying a plumber. And Sam says, <laughs> Sam says, Sam says, you did good, sweetheart. 
And she says, <laughs> she's laughing at me. She says, I did, didn't I? And then she leaves, and that's her last line of the show. Because he's talking about, of course, of course, <laughs> replacing Shelly. <laughs> anyway, that's how it ends for Rebecca. Yeah. Something about watching you walk, tear up gets me a little emotional. <laughs> Good. It's nice to cry. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't know this was such a deep podcast. So when Allison sees you crying, she's not at all confused. No. And, and Dear Van Hansen, she's probably liking it. It seems like she likes it in a it sweet was, way. <clears throat> it was weird. That one was interesting because she knew that it was coming before I did. So I'm watching the scene and I'm listening to the song and the mom singing. And she's starting to sing about the dad moving out and stuff. And Allison starts touching my leg, and I haven't started being emotional yet. Oh, so you and know. Then so. Like, and then, like twenty seconds later, I started getting emotional. So, like, she she saw it before I did. Oh, that's which is that's really cute. Cool. Yeah. Um. So I I, I don't want to I want to make sure we still we still move on because the divorce yeah. side of you is something that I I know <clears> exists, <throat> but I, I really I know so much about you, but the blank which I know isn't real is I look at you like Scrooged. <laughs> and like you're just watching Cheers yeah. over and over and over and over again. I know that we've talked about this. You and I, when we were younger, didn't really have friends. Right. Uh, every now and then we had some kids in and out. Yeah. Uh, for me, some weirdos. Same. Um, but like I wasn't included in a way that I recognized I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that is for you. I picture you just like your world is the hamster cage of television, your house, and Michael Jordan. Yeah, I guess. I guess it was. Um, I think I, I knew that there was other stuff, but I also like, I didn't have what you had where you wanted to fit in with X, Y, and Z group, like the basketball players, or whatever. I knew that they were a crew, but I didn't really care if that made sense. I was excited to get home yeah. and play PlayStation and, right. and watch the Nick at Night marathons of Cheers and Three's Company or whatever. And, uh, I didn't feel like I was missing anything. I wasn't like, oh, if only I was with those guys, I'd get invited. I, did, I wasn't yearning for anything at that time. So for me, well, way before basketball, more specifically, I thought I was part of these groups. Like mm -hmm. in third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you know, there's like those groups. And I, I thought I was part That's of them. Funny. And then <laughs> in seventh grade, when people started, uh, I think that's when people started drinking. But like people started like going out. Yeah. Um, and I was never invited anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that confused me because I was these are my boys, you know? <laughs> and then as I got older, I realized they never, they were just always kind of, you know, nice. Yeah. But like, no, I'm busy, whatever. But so, so come seventh, eighth grade, it wasn't like I've been yearning my whole life. I just thought I was in something and then yeah. I'm not in something. So I went through a few years of, of stasis and, and, and wanting uh -huh. until I found basketball, which inevitably gave me a sense of community and a team. And yeah, but yeah, it was a, a, an odd situation to be 13 and find out, oh, none of these, I thought these were my. I'm not friends. I don't have friends. That's so funny to think that you were in a group that you're not in. That's. I know it's really sad. And, well, because they always be nice to me. Damaging, but that's also like, yeah, man. I'm with Trent and Clay, and we're just fucking hanging, dude. Oh, you, just you two this time. All right, man. I'll catch you guys next time or whatever. Like, you know, because you sit with them at lunch, so, and you're so confident. And you're like, yeah, I'm with the boys. Got the puka shell necklace. Or I used whatever. to call David Price every week. <laughs> David Price, and he would always have an excuse. I'm. We're, we talk. We're friends now. Yep. But he would always be like he was never be like Rick. You're a weird, annoying dude. I don't yeah. want to, and I would have stopped calling him. Yeah. But he would always be like, I can't. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'll try, I'll try you next week. Try tomorrow. Yeah. There was a couple of times that when he when he would uh, say that he wants to, <laughs> but his which I I I remember that be like oh, like even if he can't like he want like if a girl likes you but she you know she lives in the different state it's like yeah. oh. But but her is my my mom said I can't because of blah blah blah. I remember there were a couple of times where I asked my mom. To talk to Gail, David's mom, on the phone. <laughs> I want to. I want to talk to David about this. See if he remembers it. That's so funny. Yeah. So you are walking home. There's no babysitter. You don't think you need one. There's not many friends. That doesn't even exist in your consciousness. There's just filling the day, huh? Yeah. And filling the day with, with what? Game, PlayStation, and yeah, and t television. And then, and then once the internet came along, That's I so nineties, you know, I AOL'd, and then I would be IMing the beautiful girls from school right. and like that was cool because if i'm afraid to talk to them in person well now there's a shield of course. and now i can hit up these sweet beautiful midwestern babes 
Now, and they were nice on AIM. They were nice and they would talk back to you and be like, yeah, haha. you know, it'd be great. I felt like, you know. So when was it we that because friendships? I, I know that you were talking to girls on on on, and then you got things got a little darker, and you got into some chat rooms, and you pretended to be a girl. We actually <laughs> yeah, bonded over this yeah. in a way once that. Yeah, tell me about that. <laughs> well, it's the same thing you did, man. I mean, like you go in the chat room and you you assume that like it's half girls and half boys, but obviously <laughs> right, like it's, it's like obviously it's a hundred percent guys. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know that it's AOL like two point or whatever three point and uh, so I just I think I even had a, a male friend over. One of my weirdo friends was over, and we were like, "Let's like, we're gonna like be like a." So we were like, "Hey, like we're like a thirty-seven-year-old like hot girl or whatever." I think. Did you get pictures off the internet and pretend that they were you? <laughs> no, we didn't get that to that level of nuance. Okay. But uh, but I think we were like in our deep thirties for some reason, and like we were like <laughs> we were had huge boobs. Like so, this deep. is probably seventh, eighth grade now, right? Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and we were just like. We were. La- I remember we were laughing a lot. We thought it was like a, all th- a huge joke and great. But then like seventy guys, I am just, like all the windows just keep popping up. Of like, do you accept? Do you accept? Do you accept? I'm like, holy shit! What kind of questions are they asking you? Did it ever get? Did it ever get? Did you ever do cyber sex with other guys? I did cyber sex with a girl I knew from my school, dude. The hot girl that I was obsessed with. Okay, we'll get to that. Yeah, and but, that was like the best moment of my life, bro. These guys, <laughs> these guys are messaging you. What are they saying? Show me your tits. A- yeah, they're ASL? saying how big are your boobs. And ASL. what are you saying? We were like we're thirty six double D or whatever it is, like blonde dude, like you know. Whatever. Right, we're in the nineties. In the nineties, <laughs> hot was big boobs, blonde. blonde yeah. yeah, and now like, it's I think all about it's ass. Of, yes, yeah, for sure. I think it was because of Pamela Anderson. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, she's the first she woman the I ever saw naked. Yeah, in a Playboy. Yeah. I used to go to, uh, uh, we didn't have a color printer and I would go, I would <laughs> print black and whites. No, I would go, I would use my, go to my neighbors. I went to, I went to the Weens and the Schaefer's I remember. Mm-hmm. And I used a printer and I told them I'm doing a report on Jenny McCarthy and Carmen Electra. <laughs> <laughs> I think I still I need to print these. Yeah. And I printed like 20 cause I didn't want to do too much. So I did like 20 pages at one house and 20 pages, just tons. 40 remember, pages. There was one where it was, I found a, a gold mine. It was comparing Jenny McCarthy to Carmen Electra yeah. eyes, Boobs, butt, legs, smile, oh my God. hair, and it broke it down and it showed just a picture of the eyes and just a picture of the, and, and like it had like a article about the some and that's when pictures would load like uh-huh. inch by inch uh-huh. all the way down uh-huh. and you're like oh it's almost boob oh there it is <laughs> yeah <laughs> then you go to the next one yeah so uh, you cybered with some guys. Or, <laughs> no, I did not cyber with guys. I try to catch you on that. Nice try. I so, think you might have. I might have. I, I know. I, I remember. I remember I did it as guys and girls. I remember whoever, mm-hmm. I, I remember, uh, I think what I did was, I think I said that um, I was this couple, a boy and a girl, and uh, who wants to chat or something like That's that. That's so funny. Dude. And then when a guy would chat, uh, he could talk to Samantha or whatever, you know, and then the girl would message, it would be, you know. Did whoever. you ever do the thing that Pen15 did so well in their episode about AIM where you made a fake screen name and pretended to be a different person to talk to people that no. you know? No, no. <laughs> no, I, I, I here are my phases. My phases was cybering with the hot girl in seventh grade, who is also the singer of Body Num. Oh, uh, uh, could you could we pull that up? Uh, yeah, it's on my phone. Uh, also, I want to sh- shout out to uh, Pen Fifteen on Hulu, the best, which is uh, easily the best comedy of the year I've seen so far, and one of my favorite uh, original comedies. Yeah, but they they have a really good episode about that. So, John, you have a crush on uh, your throat to me. I'll catch I'm the guy. Uh, uh, you have a, oh, what's your name? Your first name? Maria. Could you say name? I've Just been say saying. Maria, yeah. So John has this huge crush on Maria. Is this the girl that you converted for? No. That was later in high school. This is seventh grade. Okay, we'll get to that. So in seventh grade, you have a huge crush on Maria. Mm-hmm. So what are, you, what are you crushing on this girl about? She was a Latina. Mm. So we're talking age 12, C cups, big ass. So, so she's from Miami. So she was like five years ahead of everyone. Okay. So like we're just 12 year old boys. That's 12, 13 year old boys. And all of a sudden she walks out of the hall and we're all just like, we are changed. We're changed as human beings. And we're like, holy crap. Holy shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like that didn't exist. Literally didn't exist last year. Okay. <laughs> so she's popping it, dude. She's shaking it. She's got it. And all the boys like her. She's bit, Miss oh Maria. yeah. This is a song that she made in her twenties. So this was years later. 
Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Feeling strong. Uh. It has a cool, good like Mariah Carey vibe. Mariah was her role model, dude. Yeah, she she is Mariah, dude. That was she what sat, she was going for. It's good, and, and there's a it's featuring Gandhi, right? The rapper. Gandhi's the rapper. Yeah, here he comes after this chorus. Yo, there's some there's a there's a lick in this that I remember I like. Which one do I like so much? You'll find it. Here it comes. Like you need more. <laughs> Guitar, you might pick like a used guitar, dude. My crew approves of who you are. Yeah, you more than a booty call. I love the way you shake it. And your frame is so exotic. Your frame is so exotic. Alternative type of body. Know how to rock it. This is it. Drop it right. Drop it low. Oh, slow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, in middle school, she was years ahead of everyone else. So yeah, this was she like, sounds like she's still years ahead of everybody else. <laughs> she was gorgeous. It was game over, dude. So we were all obsessed with her. Dorks, losers, hot guys, cool guys. Everyone is obsessed with, with Maria. She's the queen. So you send her uh, a DM. Yeah. Or not a DM. You send her an IM. Yeah. The DM of the 90s. We IM from time to time. You know, I try to keep it fresh. I try to... Do you ever talk in school or just online? Oh, I talk in school. I'm... I'm unique in that, from, uh, unique from the stereotype in that I'm not afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. So even if you're in the cool group, I, if I feel like I, I'll talk to whoever, I'm not. Right. I'm not like I can't talk to her. So I would talk to her, say what up, you know, whatever. I'd be wearing like my WCW Nitro shirt or whatever, <laughs> and my gelled bank. Be like, hey Maria, what's up? And she would be like, <laughs> Miami. She would say Miami, and it, it, we would just move on. Um, but one day I was like, and so I think I did like. And maybe you did this too. This is embarrassing, but whatever. I think I did like one of those. I tried to come up with a way to casually mention my size on AIM. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know, it's crazy because it's, you know, fucking, you know, whatever it is, you know, whatever number of lie. Well, what do you mean it's crazy? Well, how does the conversation even just, start? I don't even, I can't, I honestly don't but remember. But you brought it up. Of course. So I you guys are talking it, yeah. about, you know, uh, PE, and then all of a sudden you're like, you know, I was noticing that my, 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 I know this sounds weird, but <laughs> yeah. like my, down, my private yeah. was kind of bothering me. Yeah. And so I measured it, and it's like, you know, huge or whatever. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and for whatever reason, in her maturation as a woman, that hit her, and she was in <laughs> for this night. Oh, man, that's got to feel a. good. It felt on You, made, you took a felt, swing and you made contact. It felt like the end of the movie when the girl kisses the guy, except we were. Just, I was just at my house typing on a computer. Right. On a, my mom's compact Presario. Sure. And she was in, dude, and we were cybering, dude. And were you actually touching yourself during this? Yeah, dude. Okay. Of course. And you this, telling this her the truth. made my year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, and you know how there's gamblers who were like, yo, this race is fixed. This is my year. That yeah, was, yeah, yeah. It's like this, a ten pole movie. This was my my sexual year. Was okay. Here. And it was like a Tuesday. Like I, was, I had school tomorrow. So you're on your mom's computer yeah, jerking off. Yeah. And she's, what is she kind of stuff she's, is she saying in seventh grade? She's as dirty as I am or dirtier. She's popping it, What man. does a seventh grader say? She's like, oh, put it in between my titties. Like, so I guess you know everything at seventh yeah, grade know. still, She huh? had already had sex in real life. We all knew Fuck. that. That was like, her and Grant Radzikowski had sex in a park. We all knew that. Dude, it's like, it's like <laughs> a kid looking at a girl who's already had sex early is kind of yeah. like women now looking at the bachelor who's still a virgin. Like you like, ooh, I want to be around yeah, that. It's different, I guess. Right. Or it seems intriguing or whatever especially when you're fucking 13 so she's saying and she's, she's saying like to oh my you, god you, like seriously john you have no idea it's so fucking big you don't even know like, so she's, she's telling you how big saying, it is yeah she's saying this shit dude and i'm like yeah i'm in and it's kind of that thing in the if you ever see the breakfast club it's uh -huh. that thing where they're, they're they're finally bonding even yeah. though they all hate each other uh -huh. and the dork is like are we gonna be friends at school tomorrow or is this just for now and the princess is like if i'm being honest no dude and that's exactly what happened so i was like yo i'm gonna go talk to her tomorrow at school dude like I, i'm in this is, my life is made i was like hey maria she's like hi and just walked away <laughs> like it was it it was just a one night only online Do you think she was embarrassed i think she's probably embarrassed i think yo i'm still a loser dork i think she still had her cool hot guys i think it, it was just well there's a difference between being embarrassed and cool, cool loser dork because you were already the loser dork she could have still had you on the side and cyber titty fucked you it, that for was, months but, it was but just she chose one, not to it was just a, a, a one so night maybe in there rome. was a bit of embarrassment or shame yeah one night in rome that we just had our moment you ever talked to her again no not really 
I talked to her later in life, but but no, you, w- I would. Lo- could we reach out to her to get permission that we played her song? Yeah, I, I'll do that. Yeah, because I think I feel I like she, you got- I believe that she's pregnant now. Oh, congratulations. congratulations! That's great. Yes, that's great. So that was my first purely hormonal crush. Yeah, that, you, that you've always been attracted. Lust. You've always been attracted to a big booty. You, yeah, I, you dude. Used you to, know, sue me. Let me know when my court date is. I'll when show you did stand up, you had a bit where you would talk about uh, shinning the boobs, the butt. But yeah, I would do that. That yeah. got me through. Can a I lot hear of you? Years. Can I hear you? Not just tell me that story, but to camera perform that bit. Ah, oh, gosh, I don't remember, but I'll try. I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase. All right, ladies and gentlemen, John <laughs> DeWalt. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Give it up for everyone you've seen tonight. Huh? Oh, great, 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 great. So, guys, like, yo, I was a dork in high school, dude. Girls didn't like me, dude. But, like, yo, I like big asses. Sue me. Let me know what my court date is. I'll be there, man. <laughs> guilty. I'm, I'm guilty, Your Honor. I like it. <laughs> So these hot babes wouldn't ha- weren't having any Johnny D in middle school, high school. But you know what? I, f- I figured out use my brain, brain power, dude. Our schools at the at our chairs at the school they had like the little backrest and then a gap and then the chair. So there's space here and then underneath the chair was a little like thing to put your books in. So I would put my foot on the book tray and I would just put my shin up into the space and I would just be shinning girls butt cheeks all during seventh and eighth grade all during class dude and I would just be sitting like this and just shinning it dude and every once in a while gr- girls would obviously be like oh what the hell what the fuck's going on but every once in a while a girl would lean back into my shin and I'd be like yo this girl's nasty dude she wants it and I'm gonna give it to her and uh, I think that was the end of the bit. I think it was oh. like I'm gonna give it to her, or like I shinned her real good, or something. Or and then, uh, and then uh, I never asked her out, or whatever. I think that I think that was essentially the story in the bit. That was John Dewalt. <laughs> <laughs> that was John Dewalt, man. Dude, yeah. that was good. And I haven't done stand up in like six years. It so does not show, on. man. <laughs> that was or five years. That was that was really good. I loved Thank how you, you brought in because uh, you didn't used to do the sue me, but you said it in conversation and you recognized that Bring makes it. it. Right yeah, in, yeah. Hot <laughs> damn, man. Yeah, that's crazy. So, all right. So, uh, your parents get divorced. You uh, watch Scrooge a whole bunch. No, cheers. Cheers. Three, right. Three, your three mom's seven. outside in the cold. Nope. Uh, like an eight mile. <laughs> nope. Okay. Not at all. Like no. That. So your mom. So your mom is at work. Uh, you get home. You're by yourself. You're watching television. You're playing PlayStation. Then the internet comes and it allows you to interact with people on multiple levels yeah. in the most intimate way you've ever had. Yes. Both sexual, uh, like jerking off on your mom's <laughs> compact. And, <laughs> And you're 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 also talking to other people, then pretending that you're a girl, and you're also just yes. talking to friends. You now you're you're you, you have, and then in college, a network. In college, I would send out a lot of nude pics to everyone right. that I knew. You and used had to send out with. nude pics <laughs> a lot. Yeah, your face ever in them? Sometimes, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> if anybody is following this no, and has one of John's no nude pics, that they've you gotta saying. send that to me. <laughs> All right, I'll blur it, but I will be posting it on here. Oh, man. I was 19. I wanted attention, dude, you know? Yeah, so you get yourself hard first, right? Of course. You only do it when you're horny. Come on, Rick. You only do it when you're horny. What are you, an amateur, dude? So, what is the mindset? No guy said in a softy. What is and remember, this is 2005 when I'm in no, college. No, I've seen black people show me pictures of their soft penis. That's weird that they would do that to I you. think because I, 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 a multiple, multiple black guys, because you talk about penises a lot with your boys, you know, and at the, at, uh, I play a lot of basketball, and I remember at the rec center at Kent, there were multiple black guys, that, sh- and I remember thinking, because you always hear that, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, yes. but they showed me their pictures of it, and, the, and it was soft, and it looked huge. And I remember thinking, there's no way. And then I realized what they probably did was they pulled it a couple of times to get the blood enough in that it doesn't rise. I've thought about this a lot. I've thought about this recently, actually. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's why they look like... Because you and I have discussed this. People, Some people are showers. Some people are growers. Show- and that's just science. That's not even like a hyperbole. Like, I am under a centimeter soft. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a grower, dude, and I think that's the same for you. But some guys, yeah, I'm sounds embarrassed. Like, sounds I'm like these black guys you played basketball with are showers. They, they can you could show. be both. They're not mutually exclusive. But showers means you can show soft. I've always wondered if there's a penis that is the same size, soft and hard, and when it gets harder, it just it just stands, but it doesn't get any bigger. Yeah, like a light switch. You should check. You should ask some. Ask if you around. have any of those, <laughs> send some pics. We'll blur them. We'll post them. So in college, you that's when but you. Beca- that was harder to do. 
to send the nudes to the girls I had class with the next day because that's when you had to have a digital camera with a memory card mm -hmm. on the timer, tripod timer, right. move, pose, check it, check it, plug it into the computer, drag it onto the desktop, and then you could email it or right. I have it. And then you had to delete it from the computer, and then you had to delete it from the camera. Right. <laughs> It's like now you get Postmates. Back then you had to go outside, grow your food, yes. cook it, clean up. There yes. was a lot of work. Yes. So there was a lot going into it. I so was a, you, a dick pic farmer back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd send this dick pic to girls and then you'd see them. Yeah. Now, do you talk before you send a dick pic? You're in class with me, right? You're in oceanography with me, right? Sure. And I'm a girl. Yeah. Um, how much interaction do you have with me before you send something like that? Like, let's say the teacher is, uh, she isn't there yet. We're, the teacher's a little late and we're just sitting here. Uh, back at this time in my stunted adolescence, um, uh, I must admit, I would say in person, very minimal talking. Just the how to, how are you? Hi, I'm get, good. How are get you? This, get the screen name. Right. Oh, my screen name's yep. Skater Girl 16. Yeah, cool, cool. Some pleasantries. And then it's predominantly online. Right. <laughs> so so you send a you send an email. You have to get I an email am. address. AIM. Right. This is AIM. Right. Okay. So you send it through AIM. Yes. So you can't delete it once you send it. No. She has it. Yes. Your face is on it. I don't care. I'm John. I want people to know. I want people to know what's up. Okay. Now you walk <laughs> yeah. in oceanography class and all we've talked about was my I am name and a couple of pleasantries. Yeah. And now I see you. Yeah. And how am I looking at you now? Am I turned off? Am I intrigued? Does this ever work for you? No, it never worked. And they were never turned off. But also n nothing. You ever know happened. they weren't turned off or they didn't act turned off. They didn't act turned off. Did you guys discuss it? No. <laughs> right. So, so you say hello again. Hey, what's up? Oh, okay. okay. Oh. And they'd be like, "Hi, hey, what's up? Yeah, good. Yeah." And they don't seem red. No, they'd be like, "Yo, this, yeah, this test is gonna be hard, but we'll, uh, hopefully we do we do well." And then you go home and you text me that test was hard, but not as hard as my big juicy cock right no, now. No, 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 no. Did you ever double send? No, double send. What does that mean? A, a week later, you send a new. Pick. No, no, no. Did you no. use the same pick? Did you you set up your pick? You got one that made you look the best, and that was the one you sent to everybody. No, I think I had a couple. Do you still have them? No. I'd love to see them. <laughs> okay. Well, no. Okay. Man, it would be you so sure like looking at dicks today, huh? <laughs> no, I don't know, man. I'm just the guy, you know. It's the guy telling it how it is. Yeah. So you're in college. Mm -hmm. You've already had cyber sex. You've already yep. sent your dick to people. But in real life, you've never actually gone on a date, kissed a girl, or talked to anybody, correct? I have kissed a girl. I kissed Maria. We went to a party in eighth grade. Spin the bottle. Landed directly on her. Maria. Her. Maria. Is the girl from Body Now. Now, who is the girl with the mu Is this only so we're, we're, we're an hour in. We haven't even gotten to your professional to life. So uh, I want to do one more question about your childhood, and yep. then we'll move on. On... Uh, uh, we our podcast that we, we we used to do together, and we'll probably do some more. The first episode podcast, check it out. John and I have been doing podcasts together since ninth grade. Blah blah blah. You have to explain what it is. Yeah. So one of the episodes we uh, it took uh, we pretended that it was it, we were in eleventh grade or whatever it was. So we were living in that moment, and John was you were telling me the story of the girl that you used to do improv with. You had a mustache. Mm -hmm. That's high school. Susan. Yeah. Yeah. So so you're. You're friends with her, you like her, she's funny. Yeah. But then you get your first taste of popularity for a, what would be equivalent to the athletic world is you made varsity. The var the JV guy, the varsity guy's talking to the JV guy. These upperclassmen, these uh -huh. improv stars uh -huh. are now showing you some credit. Yeah. But they don't like this mustache girl, uh -huh. right? Right. Yeah, so t so talk to me about this. So improv is where I found my strength, much like you did in basketball. So I started taking second city classes in Chicago when I was a junior in high school, and I, I live in the suburbs. So there, I was, even like. Let me explain, by the way, especially in the 90s. Second City, Chicago was, was uh, I don't even know what you would call it. It was like wherever, it was the training grounds for yeah. where every, I mean, Tina Fey, Steve Carell, uh, the dude, uh, Steve Colbert, the other Steve that yeah. I like so much. They're all I mean, from Second City. This, yeah. is a, this is a cool it's, place to be part it's of. It's sketch, it's improv, it's, it's live comedy. In if Chicago, they were on SNL, the they were out of this place. Yeah. So I started taking teen classes there. And like beautiful girls who would never talk to me in high school would be like, oh, you go to Chicago and do improv? That's so fun. So I started getting my voice. Right, you're getting confident and, and so value. this girl is in my improv class in Chicago. And we started dating. She was a very nice, lovely woman. We agreed to go to – I was going to go to her prom. She was going to go to my prom. Mm -hmm. It's great. I meet her mom. Everything is great. She's awesome. I'm the villain in this story. Everything I do is wrong, and she's right. Um, so – we do an improv show at the end of our class, and I fucking light it up, dude. Okay, I got it. Check. Okay, Johnny's got it. And 
she was good. She was fine. <laughs> and uh, I didn't like that at the time. I thought that, fuck, man, like, she wasn't as funny as me and these other guys. And these other guys are older than me. And they're like, they're a crew themselves. And they're like inviting me into their crew and they're t- hanging out post show. And they're like, but like, what was that scene about that, that your girl did? That scene sucked. I'm like, yeah, that scene was shit, dude. So I uh, started just being, a, I, I think I dumped her, but I don't. I ended up just being a dick to her yeah. for like a week. And then she just dumped me. But it was too late to change our prom dates. So she still went with me to my prom. And I went with her to her prom after she had dumped me because I was being a fucking asshole. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I went to two proms with her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, that's fucking crazy. Yeah, I was not a good person until I was twenty-five. <laughs> that was bad. I look back, I'm embarrassed. But hey, you know, we make mistakes when we're young. We we learn. We grow by fire or whatever. Trial by fire or whatever. So I, I want to just bring up real quick how we met, and then fast forward to a few years later um, to when we started working. Yeah, but. I moved here in uh, in the summer of, of 2008. I was living at my aunt's. I, on Craigslist, I found that there was background work on the Da Vinci Code sequel, Angels and Demons. Mm. Tom Hanks, Ron Howard, yeah. no brainer. Those yeah. are the three thoughts that I just had. Okay, <laughs> So I sign up. I don't know what background work means. I've never done it before. Mm. I just know that you're in the background of a movie, and maybe I'll be in it. Yeah, This is amazing. Crazy. Show up. It ended up being two weeks from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Yeah, it was overnight, like camp. All night, all night. Hundreds of people, but you're there for 12 hours huddled together. You get to know people. I'm on my own doing bits. Hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. I was doing pickup lines with girls, and I was mixing them up. Hey, nice. T- that's, I was saying nice tits. I was still in that <laughs> that's, other character. That's your current. <laughs> that was in the character. Move, no, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I would say like, excuse me, uh, is that a mirror in your pocket? Because uh, I just fell from heaven. Yeah, something like that. He would blend two. Yeah, I would blend them, which ultimately was a big part of what would got me, uh, get got me a career got as a stand-up career, comedian. Yes. And I went up to John and I did a pickup line. I said, "Hey, you know, uh, is that a banana in your pocket or a mirror?" And then you went right back and you said, "And then I went, Rick Glassman, nice to meet you." You went, "John DeWalt, put her there." And then I'm telling you, and I know I'm remembering this wrong. I know there's no way this is possible. But when our hands touched, uh, like I saw rays of light come out of our hands. Okay, and that was it. And that was the connection. Yeah. And then it was just Bit City. Yeah. It was Bit City. I remember you told me that you were an only child, but you also told me you had a sister, of which was another actress that you just met. Yeah, uh, at Angels of Demons. Uh-huh. I was and, pretending that she was my sister. Yeah, and you were also, your arm was always around her, and it was a little sexual. <laughs> and I knew, I knew the, lo- the, the, the logical side of me knows, oh, this guy's doing a bit, but the emotional side didn't understand what's happening. Is this your sister? Are you guys romantic? You were treating her like a sister, Yeah. but you were touching her leg and stuff. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> also, you know, not that it's that relevant of a detail, but when you tell it, you always comment on the fact that she's balding, and there's just something, f- <laughs> which is, you know, horrible, or it doesn't matter. I don't know what a point of view I'm supposed to have about that. It sucks. Yeah, <laughs> it a- sucks to be in your young 20s, a woman in your young 20s balding, yes. but just <laughs> looking back at it, I'm thinking like, I thought John had a balding sister that he fucked. <laughs> like, I don't understand. Excuse under- me. My lawyer is calling. All right. So... At this point, I probably just made an edit, a uh, pretty b- big oh. edit. John was on his phone with his lawyer for a little bit. What were we talking about? Uh, yeah, we met doing background, and it was great. And uh, uh, that was in 2008. Mm-hmm. And here we are um, in 2009, best buds. <laughs> uh, you uh, allowed me the gift of being your best man. Yeah. And um, since then, I felt like the best man. Ha! <laughs> And you had your best speech ever. Yeah, I should maybe put, put, pull that up. And you were so nervous. I've oh, never seen you so nervous. Terrifying. Why, though? Because when I do stand-up, I do stand-up selfishly, and maybe in, I have the wrong mindset, but I do it for me. Uh, I think maybe you do. You have to go 50-50 for you and for the, the, the audience, so that you get the money. Sure, sure. That's a good thing that you just r- realized. Yeah. Well, this isn't a new realization. Uh-huh. Um, uh, it's... Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not going up there just for me. But to, uh, the the idea of what is in my head is funny. If I think anybody else has influence on that, then I'm not going to be confident anymore. Like I'm up there. I guess more specifically than just for me, I'm up there by like it's a lonely place in a way that I'm fa- very comfortable in. Like I like to disconnect before going on stage. If if I 
if I project any feelings that anybody has about me, I'm going to fall because what I'm doing doesn't work if I listen to people. Mm-hmm. Point being, this was felt like your best man speech felt like a performance still. I'm standing up in front of everybody and I'm giving a performance. Uh-huh. But it was had nothing to do with me. Right. And everything that you guys thought was the only thing that mattered. So I have so much experience doing this thing, yet I have no experience in this frame of mind. Mm-hmm. So uh, I didn't write anything because I didn't know what to write. You guys should have seen Rick the day morning yeah, of. Yeah, the morning of, I hadn't written anything yet. We, my friends took me kayaking and to play basketball in the morning just to like kind of chill. And Rick was like, I, I have to walk around. I, I, I can't, <laughs> I can't. I can't be there for you on these <laughs> activities, John. Uh, and he was paid. We were out in the woods on Lake Michigan. Rick is just walking through the woods, <laughs> sweating. He's ordering mods and substitutions on like the pre selected wedding dinners. <laughs> and he's like taking a bite and he's like, I'm going to take a shit. I got to take a shit. I'm s- <laughs> I, mean, I don't feel good. And then like Allison's sister goes first and she demolishes. Everyone's crying. There's not a dry eye on the, a dry eye in the house. Allison's sister's talking about how she remembers when she came home from school and there was a pink r- balloon on the mailbox and everyone's just crying. And then Allison's dad says... Also it, the sisters. Yeah. Or the, the nieces. Yeah. And then the nieces go... Wearing uh, matching dresses. At, yeah. One at the time must have been 10. One was eight. And they give little speeches about Allison and about me. And then Allison's dad goes. And this Allison is his the uh, the youngest. So he talks about giving away his baby. And, his, and he's also getting good laughs. He's, ta- he's, he's doing poker analogies. He's and talking about laughs, how you know you want a cheer. full house and it's all fucking coming together, <laughs> he's, right? Yeah, he's he's saying goodbye to his final child. He's getting laughs and tears, and Rick's just watching and be like, "Oh fuck!" I felt like I was gonna vomit. <laughs> I felt like I was gonna vomit. I remember when the the, the when Anna finished the, the youngest girl finished your speech. You looked at Brent and me, and you were like. What the fuck? What the fuck? I can't do that. <laughs> well, it's like, just follow, like cheating. I can't follow cute little girls. <laughs> it's like it's like we're playing a high school basketball game, and then like right before me, they uh, they, they announce on the other team. Oh, and then LeBron James. It's like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah. How am I gonna top? Cute, what am I supposed to do? Cute sister girls. How am I topping this? Not only the cute sister girls, at least half the people are in love with her, and the other half know who they are. Yeah. Most of the people there, you know, eighty five percent of the people there don't know me. Of course. And for some reason, Rick goes last. Rick went after the dad. Yeah, that, which I thought was odd. I thought that was odd that I had to follow. Also, um, <laughs> there were some other friends that you had there at the time that I, I knew well, and I'd never seen them emotional before. Yeah. And they're crying. Yeah, everyone every, is everyone just was done. crying. Everyone's crying. We yeah. had, we had amazing speeches. Yeah, it was we were, it was a, it was really, an amazing weekend. We were really the whole lucky, thing yeah. was fantastic. And then you stepped up to the plate. Well, I prepared. And I had you written it. Demolished it, dude. He <laughs> was good. getting last. He was deconstructing the way you do on stage. You were doing like bits that are meta bits, but like even my aunts from Florida were getting it, and everyone was able to understand it and laughing. And then you did the emotional stuff, and then you. You you did he, Rick did bits that Allison's father had just done, and then said, you know, Bob, Bob stole those from me. Whatever, obviously. No, I no, I did it. I did it much. I got I got to step in because <laughs> yeah, I did it way yeah, cooler. Yeah. So <laughs> it opens up with uh, the the one part that I wrote, which was basically deconstructing how I've seen best man speeches and weddings I've gone to and in movies, etc. And yeah. there's certain things that you do uh, first. You know, you you, you know, you, and then you <laughs> you know you, uh, you you tell her about how beautiful the the wife looks, and uh, I told yeah, Allison uh, that she was Allison glowing. Brutal, yeah. uh, then you take a little shot at the uh, at the at the at the you know your boy, and you say, hey John, you know by the way it's twenty you know fifteen. It's called a dishwasher. <laughs> you know, and then you do that, and then you give him a little advice, which I gave you the piece of advice, which I feel is the most the most useful piece of advice a uh, best man can give a grooms which was yes dear two words <laughs> yes dear that's right which is what everyone was saying all weekend <laughs> and so rick like kind of made fun of them to their face without them really knowing like all these people i like, kind of know from alice inside were like hey little advice <laughs> Yes, dear. <laughs> what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do yeah, with that? Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. oh! But like that was like their little like wedding joke, and then Rick deconstructed it in the best man speech, and they thought it was hilarious. <laughs> it was so, great. so then that that ended with me uh, having written down and was reading. Um, and at this point is when you want to stop reading, crumble up the piece of paper, and decide, you know what? Fuck it, I'm gonna go from the heart. Yeah. And I didn't know where I was gonna go there. And as soon as I did that, I took a breath, and then. The, yes, the, the eyes just start watering. You know, I told you that when you cry, I'm, I'm watering thinking about it. When you cry, it, it does something to me. I don't know if any, I actually don't know if anybody else does that. Something about when you cry. When you watch people emotional, it gets you. Something about when you do, it, it gets me. And I, had, I hadn't seen you like that before. I mean, 
I think a lot of people watch The Groom when the bride comes down. I did both, but I definitely was fixed on you because you oh, were. I, saw. I mean, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there <laughs> thinking about it. I'm getting there too. Like, if what is love? Watch Baby, just don't this. Hurt me. <laughs> just watch this face. Yeah. As as the bride is coming down, which by the way she was glowing, and yes. I, I'm not saying this as a joke. Of course. To this day, even she's never she she's. I know. <laughs> yes. The prettiest your wife has ever been yeah. already happened. I know. And it was that, <laughs> it was right that day. And then you're just so that that carried the entire weekend, but definitely right after the wedding, it was just this is we're at this is your dream yeah it was in your dream and i remember even joking about on here but like you even wanted the weekend to be american pie you know when they go to the beach house like the yeah. whole thing was you exactly joked. you said that in your yeah speech. it was exactly how you wanted it <laughs> so then i started then i just remember when i was talking to, about you guys it just uh i didn't have prepared what i was going to say because it's not hard to talk about you guys and then i it just got way more emotional than i thought it was yeah i wasn't embarrassed but i didn't want to be there I remember thinking I didn't want to be in this right now. Oh, people loved it. I'm okay. I'm, everything's great. That's okay. I just remember the feeling in that moment of, oh, this is getting way realer than I meant to and I thought it was, and I'm not sure how to navigate my way out. And then I found uh, this old saying, and I used the, the poker one from your dad, but I, I redid dad, it. I redid yeah. it in the, the way that we would do the pickup lines. did you lines. say like he stole from you or that he did it wrong? Or no, I said, I, do, I, like, said uh, I came up with the, There's an old... I said, I came up with, came up with a this, saying. Yeah. Uh, it's about poker. And then I, and I then started... You, bad, you did them all wrong or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but then I remember after that, it got a, a great laugh. Like I should have shot like my a, special like there. a rolling laugh. Um, because yeah. it was it was just a turn of sincerity into just a good bit that was also had a built-in callback. And it's this, just the math This works. is going to sound sarcastic about the power of comedy, but think about it. Like Allison's parents are very conservative. My dad and mom were divorced. She's conservative. He's liberal. All these different types of people. Some of these people like the divorce side don't like each other. They have different opinions, different things. We're young comedians. They're kind of older, like Midwest, like blue collar people. And when the, the joke hit, when the comedy hit, everybody's laughing. Like all, it unites, it unites everybody. Now, My I know, grandma's laughing. I know, you know people, I, mean? I know weddings are easier <laughs> and people give best man speeches and they talk about it. I got to tell you something. Yeah. I, I, I've just got to, I'm in the business. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm in the entertainment business. I've uh, seen speeches. I've seen speeches kill. I've been on stages. I've been on theaters. Yeah. Okay, this was something I have never. The response. I mean, it felt like it was great, but the response after, I just did. I just did. What's the place in New York that pe people Carnegie talk Hall. about? I just did Carnegie Hall. Yeah, the people. There are guys <laughs> that were at this wedding that have never been particularly nice to me. That who? I, no names. You just had some friends that were there. Some not, of not, my friends. Uh yeah they, they were they weren't not not yeah they weren't the, the warmest with the, you had uh, there was a couple people there that weren't the warmest um they weren't mean I guess maybe that's their personality I'm gonna, that's gonna stump me for I'll tell you I, I just feel like you can't because well, tell me things have changed since tell me I don't after. think this is the reason maybe it is the reason maybe they were like you know what that kid's funny I take it back they they, they weren't mean to me it was just like I'm not oh, their friend I'm not mean. their friends. I think I know who you They're mean. your friends, not my friends. And they treated me like that. I think I know who you mean. But the way, and, and I also, outside of me, I don't think I've ever heard this person even give a compliment before, <laughs> let alone to me. I think I know you know what, what I mean? mean? And just, just like, he was like wanting to be my assistant in yeah. this moment. And it just felt fantastic. You owned the room, man. Thanks for doing such a good job. Uh, yeah, man. So uh, uh, I want to I wanna cut to 2012 because this is where... Um, We're cutting backwards now. Yeah, well... Yeah, cutting backwards. So yeah, married in fourteen. So basically, what happens was now we're in adulthood. I want to tease it with I'm the best man, and then like, wow, what's their relationship? How did this happen? The television show, the day we got there to the wedding, a couple of days before the wedding, the television show that that we all worked on, our first job premiered, and Brent and I, Brent Morn and I, got there minutes before it started. The, the beginning of the wedding was watching the half hour not, pilot not of to Undateable. Go back, but speak, you reminded me speaking of Brent. I have this picture of your speech. I'll show it to you later. Brent was that uh, a groomsman as well, and he was so nervous for Rick. He was like a dad who was nervous for his kid who's about to go like dance for people. Like <laughs> Brent was like, I don't know how fucking Rick's gonna be able to do this. And after the, the girls went, he's like, Oh, you got the little girls going up there. Like Brent was, yeah, Brent he was, was as nervous as you yeah, were. He was empathizing. And then I have this great picture of when you were killing. Brent's sitting with his legs up on your chair like this, 
and he's got like he's got like the baseball coach hand on his mouth <laughs> and he's crying laughing and he's just like so he's so relieved but also proud but also laughing at you performing and it's this great picture i have of brent watching you that i have to show you it's yeah phenomenal. i would love to see that <laughs> yeah um so but, yeah the show came out that weekend yeah the it's show fun. came out the, the the first episode of the first television show we ever worked on um so it was like a it was just it was a it was a big weekend yeah. um uh, it was a big weekend uh, that cul- a, a lot culminated in in your relationships, both with, I mean, most importantly, uh, Allison, but your family that's there, uh, uh, these Brent and I, who are some of your best friends who are there now, and this thing that you had been working on since improv in high school that that came to fruition into a career. Yeah, it was just a lot came to that. that so was crazy. that's the teaser. I want to cut back to 2012 when um, Brent had a meeting with Bill Lawrence. Who created Scrubs? Shout and, out Bill Lawrence. Shout out Bill Lawrence. Follow at V Doozer. Watch uh, Whiskey Cavalier. Whiskey Wednesdays on the ABC, dude. Yeah, ABCs. And uh, <laughs> they had a meeting, and Brent invited him to the Improv. Brent was hot. Brent was, Brent was hot. Brent, Brent just, just did came. the Fox Showcase that Liza. Shout out to Liza Katzer. Saw him at. She told Bill the they kid, had the, the meeting. Kid was hot. Kid was hot. <laughs> so you and I are on that show. This by coincidence, like thank God. By coincidence, yeah. Um, I actually, I think Brent said, I think Brent, or was it the show that I booked? Yeah, I think you booked it. Might I think have been that I remember. I remember Brent told me because he came in, after his meeting. He came in here and said he just had a meeting with Bill Lawrence, and I was literally watching, rewatching Scrubs, going. We through. were watching Scrubs together. Um, here, yeah. At this at this moment, yes, we were, we were. But at this moment in particular, I was by myself, and he walked in as the as the X ray Bill bill lawrence shot was up yeah and he said the creator of scrubs i said bill lawrence and he goes how do you even know who that name is he's literally right right here yeah yeah and brent is very good about about promoting and talking about his friends which a lot majority people aren't correct brent brent sometimes especially when he's been drinking is like my either my mom or my manager talking about stuff brent will brag about how good of a husband you are brent brags about my grandpa playing with ray charles yeah yeah, yeah, like he isn't just talking about comedy he just love my friends i do that too but brent's really good at it. brent doesn't you do do it too. brent doesn't like a business setting like he'll do it to executives uh-huh. like i do it to friends you know yeah so brent, brent had this meeting with bill and i remember he even told me that he was talking about me and i invited him to our show tonight meaning that we're all on it yeah so bill comes and uh sees us all perform and we end up uh, auditioning and Brent and I end up getting cast on it, yeah. and you become a writer's assistant on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the first year of us working at all. Ever. Um, and second year comes around, and also I want to talk about this first year of television because, I mean, there's a lot of firsts, and it was my first television show, but we don't know the rules. We, You and I, I don't think recognize them anyway, let alone the stuff that we wouldn't have been able to know yet because we don't have the experience. So the way a multicam works is... Every week you shoot an episode, the writers write it, we rehearse it, and then once we have it ready, the writers and producers come down and watch it. Once they approve, the network comes in and watches it, it's cleared to go, and then you film it. Every week you redo this. And the writers rewrite it every step. Every step of the way, they take notes from themselves, they take notes from the network. Sometimes when people improvise stuff, they'll write it in and try to make it work. But the point is, once the writers come down, there's 10 writers, four four or five of them are producers. There's like five or six fold-out chairs. And usually what would happen is the, the Bill uh, and, and, and his partner, Jeff, they would sit on the chairs and all the writers, it's no big deal, but they just all sat behind the chairs and they'd laugh and overlaugh because it's, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. yeah, stand behind the chairs. But John, the writer's assistant, was sitting next to Jeff. <laughs> so there was, there was executive producer slash creator, executive producer, and then the writer's assistant. <laughs> and John, the way he is uh, when he come to any of uh, my shows, I'm, this, this is the loudest laugher. Mm. And it's just, and it just I, I think. I for my mom. You, you got lucky. Standing outside in the snow. You got lucky, as we all did. Bill liked that. Mm-hmm. And Bill took on to you, and you would always make jokes because Brent and I, we're your, we live in the same building at this point. Mm-hmm. You're, this, you're, this building. Yes, this building. <laughs> you're literally best friends with us. I mean, there's there's a status difference a lot of times in, in, in any industry that you're in, but in television, the, the writer's PA to the writers, to the producers, and then within that, the, the writers and the actors, they're not always friends. At least those are things that I've heard, which I think is crazy. That's, you always want to be friends with everybody. That's true, and it's a real bummer. I can talk about that later if you want. So... For whatever reason, John had the confidence of 
listen, Brent and Rick are out there, and, and these producers are nice. I mean, we're all the same. We're all, and you're just <laughs> laughing, and you're pitching jokes, which not only do writers' assistants not get jokes in shows, they're not. It's it's you don't pitch it. It's solicitation. It's mm -hmm. it's. Am I am I right? And I've heard different people say this. It's different. It depends on who the boss is, but it's it's definitely a very touchy subject for sure. It's a hard. It's a minefield you have to navigate. Well, now. you got jokes in as a writer's assistant. Yeah. So needless to say. Uh, second year we get picked up, Bill says, I want you to be a writer. And correct me if I'm telling this wrong, I think this is the most beautiful story. You said, listen, I'll do it, but my wife and I are a writing team. I'll only do it if we could come on as a team. Uh, it wasn't that aggressive. It was my idea, but it was like, um, I was talking to Stekiel. I was like, hey. Stekiel, Adam Stekiel, who, who created, created the show. Dateable, and he is the best. Yeah, he's... Shout out to Adam Shout out to Ezekiel. I actually want to give a quick little segment. Yeah. He's, 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 the, he's, he's probably the funniest person He's It's met. unbelievable. Yeah. First of all, he's better looking than any of the people that were on the cast, and that's like by far. Yeah. He's, he's actually... Well, we also a had a historically yes, ugly cast. We had a historically <laughs> ugly cast. Historically <laughs> ugly cast in the annals of TV shows. But Adam also, <laughs> let's put up a picture, yeah. is just a hot guy. He's a hot guy. Who just for some reason yeah. gets it. One million percent. Yeah. Gets it. He likes to talk about he's not good at comedy math, but he's someone who just know he it's puzzle pieces. Yeah. Shout out to the sixth lead, the sixth lead.com. John and Adam helped me on that big time. And Allison. Um there's never been a writer that I've experienced in TV or movies who's better at dialogue than Adam Secchio. He can just run. He can just run it. I've talked to him about certain things I've been writing, and he just he just even even a little movement. He just understands. Here's what I think. Here's why I think it works. Here's the network notes yeah. you'll get. Here to, here's how to get around them. It's like, yo, you're fucking hot, dude. And you don't even need to tell me <laughs> yeah. any of this. Yeah. Anyway, I heard, heard he's got a big dick too. Anyway, uh, is that true? I've, it's what I've heard. Zeke and, and Ezekiel. 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 <laughs> you're saying Ezekiel bread. It's Ezekiel. By the way. Oh, I'll, you've been saying Ezekiel. I I say Adam Ezekiel. 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 Yeah. The guy gave you your first job. Anyway, uh, I probably should know his name. Anyway, uh, oops, don't do that, obviously. Oops. Uh, so I was uh, during season one, I was like, because Bill was talking about bringing me on for season two, should there be a season two? And there and shouldn't. I, and I just... <laughs> <laughs> but and for I some just, reason, they gave us I three. I just asked Adam, because he's so good with advice. I was like, hey, should I like... You know, me and Allison wrote these two pilot specs together, and we're, they're pretty good. Like, should I just have Allison on? come also and be my writing partner and he was like dude a million percent yes because <laughs> he obviously wants to, that's actually a good sequel person dude and he just he wants the free writer because right. writer partners split one salary but also like you know he knows that there's advantage to having a woman on the team and he, he, he like you it said it works for as a win-win he, he sees seven steps ahead down the field and so yeah i mean all the best scripts i wrote were with allison anyway so of course right. it was easy for sure yeah so then the second season you uh uh it takes a while to go from writer's assistant to staff writer, usually. Sometimes you could be a producer right away. I mean, there's ins and outs. But since there was no nepotism and you didn't know anybody before you started working, going from writer's assistant to then becoming a staff writer the next year on a show that has two, that, that both of which are half seasons that don't have fall air dates, that's which true. basically what that means is we're not making the playoffs, you know? <laughs> so that's, a, that's very, very cool. We're the Washington Wizards. So now you and Allison yeah. are, are writers. Yeah. On this television show that Brent and I act on, the four of us all live in the same building. Warner Brothers is 15 minutes away, if that. Yeah. So that section of those few years was really... You and I have bonded in a lot of ways, pers personal and comedy, mm -hmm. but most of the comedy we did, we did our sketches, that kind of friend .com. Yep. <laughs> they, there was nothing professional about it. Right. So now we have a new dynamic, which is I'm on a television show and I'm insecure because my other friends that are on it have more to do with me and I don't know how to deliver certain jokes a certain way and, and my ego's getting in the way and I'm sad. And you're over here working 12, 16-hour days. You're doing your own comeuppance. You're hearing about stuff that we don't hear about. There's like politics in a writer's room and people are, you know, some of the writers can be mean about the actors or nice about the actors or just sure. telling secrets. And you can't tell me stuff because you have a loyalty to this job, but also I'm your friend, so you have to hint stuff to me. I don't pick up on <laughs> hints very well. <laughs> and and the whole thing, it was, a, it was an interesting ride because uh -huh. for the first time, I was always felt like you were on my team, but from, from the day we met till now, I always felt that. Uh -huh. But for the, for the first two years, the third year, once I became a little more aware of myself and what was happening, it changed. Mm -hmm. But I felt like 
I, basically, I recognized that there were things that you couldn't tell me. Yeah. But I also knew that, and I noticed you not telling me certain things. And there was never like a conversation of, listen, Rick, I can't tell you things, but mm-hmm. there was, it, was, it was just stuff that I picked up on. And I didn't know how to navigate it. I was already had my own in my head obstacles that I was dealing with. Yeah. And I, I remember I remember I had a hard time with I can't talk to Brent about my problems because Brent is on the show and I just felt couldn't empathize with the situation that I was in. For right or wrong, I felt that from the few times I talked to him, I wasn't I just wasn't getting what I thought I needed, which what there was nothing I needed other than just more experience and understanding what my job is. But I didn't. I felt like I couldn't talk to you. I don't think I ever told you this. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't know how to talk to you about certain things. Did you feel that at all? Um, that I couldn't talk to you, or that you couldn't feel either. That. Um, yeah, I ma- felt it both ways. It wasn't just me and you. I meant we couldn't talk mm-hmm. as honestly as we normally had. Maybe um, it is tough because like writers like Bill who are at a higher level will say like if you tell an actor especially a new actor something blunt or negative even just a line you could shatter their confidence and it could get way worse much faster Mm -hmm. so like it is a fragile situation and also I'm only the assistant at that point so like really it's not my show you know what I mean so it's like I can't tell you what a much, much higher level person is thinking because they Let me could, give you an they example could, of what, could squash me. What one of those things were that I found out later. There were certain things like I would, uh, I didn't connect with my character uh, too well, especially at first uh, because I was, I was it. judging. Oh, that's Judge 100% it, yeah. the reason. Yeah. That character was, when I was up here at the beginning of this podcast, when I'm talking about the double Ds, that's, that's literally, that's I character. would have crushed if I knew how to do that on television. Well, I would have done well. I would have done fine. I would have done better. I didn't know how to do that because I was so scared that I was selling my identity as that thing, and I was being uh, I, there was a, there was I was just insecure. I didn't I was never on a show before, and anything I've ever done comedy wise, I was in complete control over. Whether it's stand up or the sketches that we did, I was able to create these things. So when I was told something in a way that I wasn't able to connect to, for whatever reason, I had a hard time. Not the point. But you also judge the medium a little bit, where it's like you like yes. to be deconstructive. You like to be like, I know the devices, so now let me comment on the devices. Whereas a network, multi amp sitcom, is just the devices. I did as much as I grew up and watching like, them. I it, didn't understand no that. There's no curveball. It's just Correct. a fastball down the middle. And you had trouble because you wanted to do curveballs because they're cooler and more unique and smarter. But this was just hit me with the fastball right down the middle. And that was harder for you because I get you've never done it mm-hmm. in stand up and sketches, and so then you're like, "This is lame. I don't get enough lines." And the lines I do get are like fastballs, and this is fucking 1994, like whatever. Yeah, which I, I felt understand. it was very dated. Yeah, which I understand. It is a dated. Medium, but I was but. I wasn't hired to write a television show. Right. I was hired to I, I'm 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 a, I'm a curtain. I'm hired to just be part of the bar or be part of this thing. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't get it. Yeah, I didn't get it. And looking back on it, I don't regret any of that because I learned so much, not just about what television is, what about this business is, but also about how my lack of awareness could get in the way and when and why to question everything, especially for myself. Yeah. But looking back at that, I would have had a much better time that first, especially first year. Third year was one of the greatest years ever. I don't think anything could be like that when we got to go live like that. But anyway, so during the, that time, I, I recognized that between you and I, and I, I don't remember if there's something else I want to say. I just want to... Oh, yeah. Yeah, like you were needed to be Cliff Cl- Clavin. Like there's some episodes where you'll have two lines that you need to hit. So some episodes you'll have stories that you need to carry. Like it's, you know, it's just whatever serves the show. And I think a lot of actors, maybe even writers too, don't see the forest from the trees. Mm-hmm. They're like, yo, these are my lines. This is my joke. How, I, I could do this better. This should be this. I should have more of this. Yeah, it becomes very but you're personal. you're not looking at the entire episode right. where there's seven actors and these are the two main ones and this is the story that mm-hmm. we're telling and this is how we're telling the story and how do you fit in? How do you support the story while also scoring? Yeah, I definitely and, got my... I was definitely stuff. keeping track of my rebounds and I was not paying attention to getting to the finals and yeah. I got in my own way with that. Yeah, But there were certain things that I, I think could have helped me out so much that happened with us towards at least in the third season that I think is important and, and, and and bigger than this situation between us and bigger than television, but just about being able to be direct with people and speak directly to people. And people would benefit from information more than you think it would shatter the ego. And there were a couple of times where a joke got cut and you would tell me after the fact that, well, you did it this way. And Bill said he wanted it done this way. And I remember thinking, 
just tell me. Yeah. Tell, tell me. I, I would love if I'm doing something that could be done a better way. I of course I want to know. That's like giving me the answers before I have to take the test on television. Yeah. But as you kind of explain and you explain to me then, which I just I cannot connect to this logic. I understand people have egos. I guess you have to find a way to to have somebody receive some information. But you've told me multiple times on different shows you worked on that jokes get cut, guest stars come in because they didn't all if they made this little tweak it would have been fine. Yeah. But why don't writers and why aren't we willing to tell our TV actors that when you you won't direct a TV actor. You only direct movie actors on I, multicam. I understand why writers don't do it. I do agree with you. I wish that we would be empowered to, but there's a lot of times a lot of actors don't a lot of actors don't see it the way you and Brent do, where you would love a line read or it would be collaborative and be like, oh, of course, it's much funnier if I do it that way. Thank you. A lot, a lot of actors would would fucking lose their fucking shit. If anyone gave them a line read, we have, I mean, I won't name names, but on shows I've worked on, uh, uh, these are people that have been in the business for a long these time. These are though. like actual names. They, it, right. you know, you, you pitch a joke, a line read, it, it goes to the showrunner, the showrunner tells the director, Hey, can we get it where it's, he does it like this. The director walks into the set to tell the, ac the actor and the actor goes, no. And just That's like goes crazy. by, he goes, what you, we did one. We're in front of an, a live audience, 300 people. And he goes, no. And the director's like, okay, well, we just need, he goes, what you're going to get is what you're going to get. What you're going to get is what you're going to get. Like there's this, I don't know, the actors make the most money. They are the face of the show. They're selling the show. They're what they're, you know, they, they're obviously such an important part to any project, but like there's this ego political red tape thing that exists where some actors would love to be collaborative and some actors are like, yo, you talk to me, you're out, you know? Like, so what is, is the it's, mindset, it's, it's just is the mindset of that having been done for so long that you feel the reason, if I, the reason I'm so successful over this past 35 years is because of the choices I've made and now someone's coming in and telling me my choices are wrong. Yeah. Obviously they're not. Right. That's the mindset. And it's yeah. an arrogance and a lack of collaborate do you think that, that it keeps them from collaborating or would they only listen to people who have been doing it longer than them maybe i'm just case by case i, I don't know man it's case by man, case. man i can't imagine ever getting to a point to where the person who's writing my it's, it's words an insult because by give, giving you a line read or a pitch of a different way you're saying my choice is wrong but what about when but you are giving an, them the script but you're I'm giving an, them a script but i'm an alpha male actor dude and my choice is not fucking wrong because i'm the guy and like it just that just doesn't fly for a lot. That's got to feel good though to be able to, to really believe in yourself that much. Probably feels pretty good. I I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm the guy. You tell me the words, but I'll make the I'll I'll yeah, do the, like the my parentheticals. Choice is, my choice is better than whatever you do. Yeah, that seems like Which a hard thing to navigate. It doesn't seem to be the case, in my personal opinion. <laughs> well, um, if you're out there, uh, and your director who works with me someday, and you have a line read for me, I would love to hear it, man. Yeah, maybe it's worth it just to tell your showrunners and directors when you like day one a table read. Just be like, yo, but just for, so you know, I would love line reads. I like. also don't, I usually don't require a line read. I mean, I love to make the yeah. choice and I understand jokes, but if I miss something or if there's another version of this that could help with something, like, we had tell a guest, me. We had a guest star on The Cool Kids this year and I thought he did a really, I overheard him come up to our showrunner. I thought he did a good job where he had this joke. He was getting big laughs. He, he had a really funny scene as this really funny restaurant manager. And there was this one line that wasn't as big as the other lines. And he is a seasoned guest star. He'd been on a ton of shows. So he comes up to our boss and he goes, he put it on himself. He was asking for a different joke. He wanted an alt. But he was like, is there an alternate joke I can do here? Because I just feel like I'm not scoring enough with this part the way I am with the other parts. And by, like, by mm. saying like, yo, I'm not hitting it hard enough. Then the boss went to our alt pack. We got a new pitch. And then the guy ended up get, having a new joke that he did great with. But I thought I was like, oh, that's such that's, a yeah, great that's move. A pro, that's, that's a pro. That's a professional way. Professional way yeah. of doing it. He's like, I'm just not hitting it hard enough for you. Is there another joke I can try? I and like I that. Thought, I thought that was a really smart move. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. So, so you are on Dateable. Uh, you write on that. Yeah. And then uh, the show gets canceled, and we all find out pretty late. Like for an actor, it's after most of the pilots were were auditioned for and cast. Oh, they were done. They were filmed, dude. It was like May. Yeah, it was May. May. Yeah, it was like it, it was you, April or May of 2016. You guys were completely robbed of. A so we weren't season. able to work for a while, but but it's uh, as an actor, we made 
significantly more money than a, than a, the lowest level writer, especially that had to split it with their wife. Yeah. So even though we all made some money, I was comfortable for a little bit. My, I'm still in the same building I was in then. My lifestyle didn't change. I'm okay. I'm, I won't work. But you went through a you went through a very frightening moment, which you've had before. That's the worst. worst you are worst uh, because of, of the business. way you grew up. You were very, 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 very scared of poverty. Yeah. And sometimes your life revolves around running away from that. Yeah. And when you don't have a check coming in and you are married and you're not sure, it's also not easy to get a writing job. You don't have that much experience no, at this it's, point. It's really hard. And I didn't know that at the time. I, Danny Zucker, shout out Danny Zucker, Modern Family Executive Producer, DZ. Shout out Danny. He once told me when I was in this, we, me and Allison didn't work again for 18 months after Undateable. And he said, you know, getting your heart, getting your first professional job is the second hardest thing you'll ever do. Getting your second job is the hardest thing that you'll ever do. And that's kind of where you are now in terms of series regular stuff. Like, I'm, there's something true about that. Like, getting one guy to be like, "Yo, this is a new up and comer," and yeah, I believe people in like him. to this is discover. Yeah, I discovered this person. Here's their first job, and now versus being, getting a stranger right. to be like, "This guy's worked before. He's already been discovered, but like, he's good for this job." It's it's harder. It, and and when you come into your second job, as, at least as a writer, you're getting more money in the second job. You're taking a bigger chunk of the budget out. It's a much harder mm -hmm. sell for sure. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, you know, my mom always uh, worked really hard to provide the house, but we were always lower middle class. We were always tr struggling like week, month to month, but my mom always made it happen. So like me, when I turned pro, I'm like, yo, I turned pro. I did it. I'm not like a dog walker who goes on auditions anymore. Like I'm a pro writer. And then I get married. So now I'm not just me. I'm, I'm responsible for Allison too in my head as the, as the male ego. And like, like I hope I hope you leave this part in in the podcast because to me the scariest thing about pursuing a career in entertainment is you gamble your twenties and thirties like you go all in you're gonna go to move to L A or New York you're gonna try you're taking the classes you're doing the open mics you're gonna meet the people you da 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 if you don't make it if you don't get lucky and if you're not good enough combo all of a sudden you're 32 and you don't have a job and mm -hmm. you don't have savings and you don't have a degree and you don't have it's like, oops! I gamble. I'm all in. I gambled every. I gambled my the best years of my life. Right. And I have nothing. So like, it's a. And really, we knew that going in. And yeah, and you kind, but you when you're 20, like you kind of understand. When you're 20, I think you think there's no way it's not going to work. Of course, dude. I'm you, gonna I was fucking told my whole life, shit, follow dude. your dreams. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be game over, bitch. John DeWalter. <laughs> like, but when you're 30, you're like, oh my god. Uh huh. <laughs> And so now I'm married, dude. And, and like, it's not like it's not like if you want another job, if you want to go get a master's, first of all, you have to go back to school, which is going to cost you like 50K. Now you're 34, <laughs> 35, yeah. and you're looking for an entry position competing with 21 year olds, yeah. 22 year olds. It's crazy. You're gambling mm -hmm. with the best years of your life. Um, so after Undateable, the un six months later, the unemployment runs out, and now the savings start to go away quickly. And we get close to a couple of jobs. We got close to American Dad. We didn't get it. And then we sold a movie. Shout sold, out to uh, Mrs. Claus. We sold Mrs. Claus to Universal Studios. First movie pitch. For our first pitch. And we thought that, oh, phew, we're saved. But then the movie business is structured. It's, there's like these legal loopholes. This was based on a, on a book from Scholastic. Universal was renegotiating their deal with Scholastic. And until that deal is done, they can't then do the deals on the individual properties, which is what our movie was. We didn't get paid for eight months after that. <laughs> so then I was like, we thought we were saved and we're professionals. So again. Allison is babysitting again. Yeah, Allison has to You're go back dog to walking. No, you're driving Uber now. I think I drove a lift a little bit. Yeah, it was tough. I walked some, maybe I walked some dogs again. Yeah. But I, borrow, I had to borrow money from my mom. I had to borrow money from you and Brent because you guys were actors and you got paid so much more. And I was like, "Yo, I got this. I got this big movie check coming, man. I'll pay you back." Like, it's, yeah, it's, well, it's, also, it's in the it's in the, the mail, man. The way you were wording it, you know, there's no kneecaps to be broken yeah. at the time. It's like you'll you'll get it to me, you know, but like you'll, you'll be fine. Borrowing money as an adult, a married adult, feels uh, who, by the way, sold a movie. It feels like shit, dude. It's the mm. worst. But then uh, we were able to get back into. We were lucky enough to get our second TV job and a third TV job. So. It's been nice since then, but that was a very hard time. So now, uh, I think because it's psychologically, sorry, you feel like when you're aspiring, when you're trying, when you're doing stand up, when you're when you have a day job, like I was a dog walker, you feel like you're supposed to be doing this, like you're you're trying to get in, right? But once you get in, and then to fall back out is really fucking hard. That because then you feel like I'm past this, I can't be doing this shit anymore, right? I'm going backwards. I thought I was going forwards. So it's a it's, sense of shame. It's a sense of shame. It's really bad. Yeah. 
Would you say that it was more or less shameful than what <laughs> has been described to me as your lowest point ever, your Bubba Fett Hollywood Boulevard time? <laughs> Uh, there's there's no shame in it. There's more shame in the Boba Fett thing. But like uh, this is just it's a character building for 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 a writer, a career yeah. writer. You're gonna have. Drops. I feel I I I I feel that. I mean, I I intentionally didn't move out because into a, a bigger place because who knows when the next job's coming. I was aware of that, but I was also thinking like it's gonna come. You know, I, I'm not. You know, you you go into the you put money in your retirement account because it's a seatbelt. But you like to think by that point you'll, you're you're fine. But yeah. you still do it. Yeah. So I did what you're supposed to do. Um. You know, I, I postmated more, but like I, my lifestyle didn't really change. Yeah. And then the show gets canceled, and you know what? My, my I didn't have an agent when I booked on date. I was doing stand up. I had, I had two auditions. I did a screen test for both of them, which is great. And I booked one of them. This is easy. Yeah. I mean, I know it's not. I know how lucky I got. But you've got the look. You've got it. Yeah. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Jewish, awkward-looking guy with big hair. I had the big and glasses big and big energy, and I'm silly, and I'm in my 20s, and it's like, oh, really? come on. He's going to be great. And yeah. these funny guys, the, the, the cast and the writers are an unbelievably of undateable, talented group of people yeah. who on their own are probably, are, if not most of them already are, but are going to do, they're funny. It's just undateable yeah. was a bit of a mess. Okay, yeah. I mean it was amazing. Yeah, but it was just like a lot of people didn't, you know, what what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, Chris and Brent are, you know, <laughs> for you know twenty two <laughs> minutes. But n then the television show yeah, ends. I loved it. And now I've auditioned, you know, maybe for fifteen things. I but not many. But you know, oh, I'm on hold for this or this, but I haven't gotten one thing. Cut to you know three years later, and. I've worked, you know, I, I'm still, I'm making a living and, you know, I did uh, a cool Netflix movie, shout out to David Wayne and a futile and stupid gesture. Mm -hmm. Very good. It's still your best work today. I've that, done that's some, what you have to top, but that, that was your best work. But getting, getting job to job takes care of the bills from month to month. And unless you have a regular job, a staff writer, a series regular on a television show, or you make it well enough to where you get paid enough to do a movie, uh -huh. really the only way you're either kind of in a studio, one bedroom apartment, or you have a two plus million dollar house. Yeah. There's very little in between because if you're getting constant work. Thanks you get, to Obama. I don't know. Are you burn, were you burning Obama or Trump? I'm making fun of people who blame everything on Obama. Yeah, man. I'm pro Obama, making fun of people who blame things on Obama. So you were doing, yeah, thanks Obama. There's no middle class. Yeah, thanks, Obama. thanks to Obama, dude. It's funny, dude. Thank you. <laughs> so really the only way to make it as an actor it's to be a series regular. It's to be either a movie star or a series regular on a television show. Yeah. You see people that are on shows all the time and they pop in and out. That's a grind. That's a I grind. Have no, no idea how they do to it. To audition and then book and then shoot. Because you get five grand over here. Two months later, you get like maybe 7,500. Yeah, and five grand five makes. Five months later, you get eight grand. Like, right. That's a tough. Minus taxes, minus commissions. And the negotiation is this is he's coming on the show for two days. We're giving him five, seven thousand dollars $7,000. That yeah. sounds like a lot. It is, but that's not the only job. The, the other yeah. job is the 100 other times you hire acting coaches and go to. And your rent is driving two, two everywhere to audition. Yeah. yeah. That's brutal. Fucking man. sucks, dude. Don't move here. Don't move here. Stay home. <laughs> but if you are going to move here, gamble your be a, be a writer, <laughs> create content, do stand-up, do something. And that's, interestingly enough, what seems to be happening now with Instagram. And uh, now it's going to be easy to find talent, dude. Thank God. Just go to the Explore page and type in white people be like. And, and then that's your next series reg. Yeah, man. But I am, I am happy to say that uh, John and Allison are having a, ch a child probably a week or two after this comes out. Yeah. And Shout out to Patrick Walsh you, for hiring us two years in a row and living biblically in the cool kids, putting us in a spot where we could even think about having a baby. And uh, you guys got a, because uh, you had a one bedroom here as well, you guys got a, a new place, a little bigger, mm -hmm. washer and dryer, high ceilings, <laughs> gorgeous. I, I tell you every time I walk in, I love your kitchen so much. Just, yeah, it's nice. It's just open. Yeah. And the tiles are big. And big, that matters. Big tiles, big that tiles. matters because everything's big there, you know? Yeah. And it's great. Um, and seeing you about to be a dad where it's so easy 
to worry and stress, <laughs> especially when you were worried and stressed when you didn't have <laughs> a, kid. a kid on the way. <laughs> yeah, like I'm what excited. a ble- what a blessing it is because you're not sure what's happening as nobody does, but you're not yeah. sure what's happening in the show next year. Will it go? Will you go back with it? Uh-huh. But you have a sense of ease and confidence about you that is newer and very earned, which is we're fine. If I don't get this now, I'm fine. I know this is happening. You have other other irons in the fire, and but more specifically, you have a confidence of knowing. Yeah, man, I'm. We're the best. We're, you know, like we're everybody wants us. Yeah, and not to sound it, cheesy, a lot of that comes from Allison. Like, uh, you know, just from working with her on all these different shows, with all these different people f- for the past five years, is like people really like Allison, dude. <laughs> and like, I'm definitely very confident in myself. I can get a joke in there. I know what the show needs. I feel very strong about learning the showrunner's sense of humor and pitching towards his strike zone. But like. As I'm like the silly dumb fuck, and Allison's like the straight man who rolls her eyes at me. If in our dynamic, like people love Allison, and she's so good at writing, dude. I always compare us to Shaq and Kobe, where I'm Kobe because I have to, it takes me so much work. I'm always stressed out. We got to get at least six pages done. We got to do this outline, da da da. And Allison could fucking care less, and then just pitch the perfect thing and write the perfect scene, and it's way better than what I did. So you can see how good of a writer John is. <laughs> Notice how he humbly. Wrote himself in as Kobe. Yeah, baby. Because he's not as good as his rock star wife. Who is Shaq. Yes. She just shows up day one and is uh, the best. And I, it takes me a lot of work. To Allison be is unbelievable. I love Allison. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievably likable. Yeah. I'd be shocked if he told me that 100% of the people didn't like her, let alone... Oh. But to say that you're not sure about that about yourself, I f- want to first read you a DM that I got today. No, I feel good about myself. Don't, but, but, don't, don't get me wrong. Oh, so you know how likable you are? <laughs> no, sometimes. It's okay. Case by case. Okay, case by case. <laughs> so uh, we went to the Lake Show. Shout out to LBJ. The King. Thank you, King. And I posted some videos of you from there. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put it on here in a second. Sure. But uh, someone writes me, why isn't he on TV? I, of course, hearted it, but you know. I don't, I don't know. Why aren't I? <laughs> why, why aren't I is a good answer. And then I, I wrote back, he writes it. Yeah, and then she wrote, "I know the cool kids on Fox and Hulu swipe up to subscribe, but no one has his energy. You guys are super funny together." That's nice. She said to swipe up and subscribe. Uh, That's so I, nice. I want to I want to pl- play these, uh, um, uh, and have your eye line be here, so it'll look like you're looking at the little squ- uh, picture in picture. Oh no! Hey ref, do you use T-Mobile? Cause that was a bad call. <laughs> That's actually really funny. Hey, hey, wizards! Did you cast a spell on how to be the worst? <laughs> <laughs> <You> got him! <laughs> oh, oh, get the ball to Caldwell Pope! Because he's my Pope in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Swish! Got him! <laughs> the, I like this one. Because I tell you, I whisper to you, say got him. <laughs> like like it's something that needs to be directed you know and like and a dateable craig doyle shout out to craig doyle shout out to craig doyle super funny writer would Very always funny. tell these stories about these he'd have like these white trash friends who would always be like fucking lakers <laughs> so that's why i said lakers that way in that video <laughs> Like he said, we'd just be, Doyle had a story where we like, we were like at a funeral or something and you just hear, Lakers. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff, dude. Respect. Well, that's about, that'll about do it, man. That'll do her. Um, since you and I started off uh, pretty heavy in the improv world, mm. you more so than I with your, with your, uh, with the esteem of Second City mm. College. But me, I mean, I grew up just basically, I lived a life of improvisation. Man. Mm. I would Sometimes I would hand my teacher an apple and she'd say, what are you doing? And i say, it's an apple. And you are the weakest link. Goodbye. It's or, good that you you had the and ready. Yeah, That's yeah, really yeah. good. That's advanced. Yeah. But I watched I watched whose line the, was it. You're the Michael Scott of improv, dude. Thank you, man. You're the Wayne Gretzky of missing 100% of the shots you don't take, dude. Deep cut. So uh, I thought it's only proper if... We end this podcast with a little improv scene between you and I. Okay. Scoop D. Cut for quality. Oh, yeah.
So that's just some examples of how I'm from the go. Little little razz, little bass. But it all comes together perfectly and beautifully. So that's kind of improv. It's John DeWalt. Thank you for visiting me on Take Your Shoes Off podcast. I'm Rick Glassman. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>